Hey guys, I'm doing another quick review and this one is called When Air Hits Your Brain. This is a neurosurgery book which was written about a quarter of a century ago. So that will explain some of the things I'm going to say about it. Some of the technology and dare I say some of the attitudes are a bit out of date. But it was a very interesting book because it had a lot of formative cases. I'd say there are probably about four or five really hard hitting cases in this book which probably showcase some of the harder parts of being a neurosurgeon. And I think that's very useful for someone who is interested in neurosurgery for me to have uh, listened to this. Um, I want to go into detail first and say who this book is for. I mean, I wouldn't say this book is for everyone. It's a book that everyone could learn something from because it would show you some of the attitudes of doctors. But at the same time, it is out of date and I'm not sure the attitudes currently reflect what they were a quarter of a century ago. So I feel like it's, it's more a good book that has stood the test of time that is very good for someone who's interested in neurosurgery. My, my supervisor on my placement recommended I read it and I, I went through it this week and I gotta say I'm very impressed by it. Now the thing about this book is the attitudes. I remember watching Goodfellas, or Wise Guys as I think it's called in America, and I remember thinking these are some very interesting characters. They're terrible human beings but they have interesting personalities. I sort of want to watch them because they are not fun, but amusing people to watch, but I also want it to blow up in their faces because they're terrible human beings. There are some people in this book, and it's a real book, it's non-fiction, that are like that. There are people who make jokes, there are people who have done things which, quite frankly, are heinous. Like, there, there's someone who said, uh, oh, oh, screw you, boss, or, or fuck you, Fred, or, or something like that on a skull when they're operating on an individual. Now, I don't know how it works in America, but I'm pretty sure I've heard of doctors getting well, having their medical license taken away for, say, branding their initials on someone's liver. The idea of defining someone's cranium is just unspeakable to me. It's bizarre. I mean, I don't know, maybe that's what the cool kids were doing back in the day, but that just seems completely... There's a personality in my mind where they see the patient's trust that is given to them for them to be able to operate on their brain, which, you know, it may be the closest thing we have to a soul. It may be the soul, or however you want to approach it, but it's an important organ, and they're putting the most important part of their life in your hands. Instead of seeing it as an advance on the trust that you are going to earn by behaving professionally, some people in this book very much seem to take it as just, just power. And you know, it's not so much that the patient is amazing for giving you their trust, it's that you are amazing for having that power. And there are some characters where it is really quite astounding. You know, the sort of uh, lad culture, it, the behavior in many cases seemed a bit more macho, a bit like a bunch of lads going down to the pub and they're operating on a bunch of people's brains and when they screwed up you know they might not be dead but they might wish they were or they might wish they were if they could even think well enough to wish they were dead so i don't know in that sense it's i, I gotta ask myself would i want to be in a career path where there would be many people like that now i have actually shadowed a fair few neurosurgeons and at least the more senior ones do not seem to be like that I mean, I've, it's possible that, you know, I've, I've ended up with the cherry-picked ones who aren't complete assholes, and the people I've had as supervisors aren't, and that there's a whole, you know, plethora of people who are different flavors of shit. But I'm left with the opinion that over the course of a quarter of a century, and it's probably a bit more than that, because the person who wrote the book when I think they were, I can't remember, I think they might have been turning into a consultant at the time when they finished the book, so it was, it was like a 10-year span or something like that when they were even writing it. So it's, re it's really more like 30 something years. So it's it's a good deal out of date. I suppose it'd be like saying, what, what, what the 70s or the 80s? You know, that, that's like when Thatcher was in charge or something. So it, it was a long time ago, certainly before my time, many of it, much of it took place. But it, it is a bit of an eye opener how some people really take power and they really can get high off it. And there is something in that which makes me a bit more skeptical. I mean, to be honest, like when I was hearing some of the things that they said, I was thinking to myself, I want CCTV in operating theatres. If someone was operating on me, I would want to know they weren't bloody flirting with the nurse or, or putting something in my skull. Not, not like a, a chip or anything, but, you know, graffitiing in someone's skull. I, I mean, if, if you wrote something inappropriate on a note, then surely it would be, you know, you get in trouble. But if you wrote in someone's cranium, that's, I feel like that's going to sound a little profantic here, but... That's defiling someone's very being. You know, that's that's sacrilege. And in quite a secular world, maybe that seems like too strong a term, but that's that's how I see it. But they were interesting characters. And oh, okay, they said some funny things. But the thing is, the fact that they could be this larger-than-life character and get away with it, 
makes me seem like it was more than just a few individuals. It was a culture. So I, I just think to myself, how much has it changed? Because I, I don't see that. I've been in operating phase. I've never seen anything like that. So maybe to test how much neurosurgery is changing and perhaps over the course of my potential career, how much it will continue to change, which <laughs> from what I read in the book is a very good thing. But that's, that's one element of the book. I also want to touch on some other elements of the book, the humbling side, whereby when they do practice over and over again, when you've lost so many people, a bit like a soldier, I suppose, they seem to become numb to the pain because you need a doctor to be able to care about you, that they want to help you, but not so much that if something bad happens to you, they can't help the next person. If someone dies and you're an emotional wreck for a month, that's a month's worth of patients you can't help. So it's a case where I suppose you need to like someone a bit like a co-worker who's sort of somewhere between a co-worker and a friend, but not so much that they're your best friend. And if they fell to pieces, you wouldn't be able to, you know, live with yourself, which is probably the reason why people, as someone said in the book, don't operate on their spouses, because you wouldn't be able to emotionally keep to death. But then you, there's like an optimum Goldilocks zone emotional distance, which I think is quite telling. I mean, I've always sort of, I think everyone feels that, but someone put it into an interesting term. We've got to have the right distance, you know, not too far away, not too close, a certain distance where you can care, but not be emotionally disabled, where you're still able to function as a doctor. Patients want to be treated first and foremost. They want someone to care, but first they want to be treated. Caring is secondary to that. In this book, there were some really heart-wrenching stories. There was a case of a woman who had a brain tumour. I think it was a brain tumour. And she was pregnant. And, you know, she, radiotherapy was an option. She said she wasn't going to have it. So she effectively chose to definitely die, or at least sooner than she perhaps otherwise would have, so that she could carry her baby to term. And... And then she died and it, she was apparently quite a beautiful woman and everything about her got distorted. Her face, the drugs made her go quite literally pear-shaped. They distorted her, she looked sickly and all those things about how cancer can tear people to pieces. And, and there's a certain, certain level of everyday heroism. I'm reminded of a quote from another book. I think it was, it, it was a book, I think called something like How Not To Be A Boy or something. It's that someone said, life is a futile battle against death in the end, but love is the thing that renders death's victory eternally empty. And, you know, I've, I've seen that that uh, saying play out in countless metaphors, countless anecdotes in this book of people caring about their families. And, and that's probably one of the best examples I've ever seen. It really articulates it, how much she cared for her child and she was willing to die and she had a faith that helped her. And you could ha have the question of, oh, d did she believe the baby was more alive than they actually were did she you know what was she what, what was it the christian mindset whereby she was unwilling to have an abortion to live a little longer because she felt it was already alive or was it just the maternal instinct that she wanted to just care for a child and she wanted to leave something behind before she died and she found solitude in her faith and it's one of those things where i feel like as, as a doctor you respect the patient it's not your job to tell a patient whether or not god is real or not you have to respect their beliefs about what they choose I'm, I'm going to be honest, like, I, I don't normally find myself brought to tears by books. But this book did that several times. Not much, but, you know, a little bit of an irritation in my eye. Thinking to myself, that could be me one day. Because that's, that's the thing about a book. When it's non-fiction, when it's real, fictional stories, they're in a different realm. Non-fiction. They're in this realm. They're in our realm. And I just find myself thinking... There's so much here which I think is timeless, but there's also the attitudes which I really hope are very much dated and timed and will continue to become even more dated and times. So there is that. I would recommend this book to anyone who wants to do neurosurgery. I've read quite a few books about medicine, partic particularly, you know, the ones where you're interested looking at from the outside wanting to get in. I've read When Breath Becomes Air. I've read all of, I'm going to butcher his name here, Atul Gawande's books. So Complications, Being Mortal. Being Mortal is a very good book. I'd recommend reading that. But the thing is, this is probably the best one for neurosurgery. Like, if you're in medical school and you're interested in neurosurgery, forget Henry Marshall's books, because honestly, I find him to be a bit of a whiner. He just complains about everything. And one thing I've learned about people who complain is you think they have been jaded by life and made into complaints? No, no, they've all been complaining when they're a child. It's their contract with the world. Some people are positive even when they're suffering. Other people are just miserable all the time. There's very little variation in that, I find. They just are who they are. 
Henry Mosh, too miserable, don't like his books, read both of them, blah, 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 blah. But he's a neurosurgeon, he's very clever, and he says some clever things. This book is better because it looks at both sides, it actually looks at comparisons between America and the UK, which is a very nice thing because some people might want to think about moving over from America to the UK or vice versa, and it is nice to get that comparison. And he has some very good criticisms. People in the UK, the health service is underfunded, who would have guessed? It's not a technical book, but in terms of understanding culture, and mindsets and some of the terrible positions people and certainly with the position of brain tumors is very 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 interesting it, it's not up to date in terms of the political realities but the general theme of uk underfunded maybe maybe overall i would really recommend this book to anyone who's interested in neurosurgery i found it astounding and i'm very glad my supervisor recommended it. okay so that's the video Thank you for watching, and if you like the video, feel free to leave a like, maybe subscribe, and tick the bell. And as always, if you like what you've seen here and want to see more, maybe click on one of the videos I have come up, probably on the screen right now. Okay, best wishes.